He turned and started to walk across the room. And as he turned, Martell moved. His face stayed dead, expressionless, but he moved. He picked up a heavy wrench, followed him, and then as Roy reached for the switch, he hit him. No! I heard his skull go like a rotten pumpkin shell, and he went down. Then Martell picked up a hacksaw and... No, no, I don't want to remember the rest. It was too awful, too horrible. Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fear is the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Terror Out of Space. <laughs> Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story, which we prophesy will be long remembered as a classic, is by Robert Newman. A tale out of the news and out of man's deepest fears called Terror Out of Space. Larkin! Don! Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You've got to hear me. I haven't got much time. They'll be coming back in a few minutes and done. Try and get this. Try and remember. Remember. I sat up in bed, straining my ears, listening. The surf was rolling and pounding on the beach at the foot of the cliff. One of the dynamos was purring away next door in the experimentation shack. And that was all. Had I really heard anything... Or had I just imagined it, dreamed it, I didn't know. All I knew was that I was in a cold sweat, shivering even though it was a hot summer's night. But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. Just what had happened. Maybe I could get it all straight, fill in the gaps that had been bothering me if I went back over it again from the beginning. I hadn't wanted to before this. I'd fought against even thinking about it. But now, now it was as if something was making me think about it. That's right, John. Start way back, in the beginning. Then maybe you will remember. You've got to. You've got to. When was the beginning? When they assigned me here, I guess, miles from anywhere on the Jersey coast. I knew it was some kind of hush-hush project, and I'd been in the Army long enough not to ask questions. I had some ideas, though, and when I walked into administration and found Professor Martell there, I was pretty sure they were right. Lieutenant Larkin reporting for duty, sir. Hello, John. How are you? Fine, Professor. Uh, I mean, Major. Well, let's forget the Major. <laughs> I've been trying to. <laughs> I think the Army's a little sorry about the whole thing also. Oh, that's not the way I heard it. Some of the things you've worked out in the last few years was something. Quite a break, my getting assigned here. <laughs> you think it was an accident? You, you mean you requested me? Of course. What did I take you away from, by the way? Oh, nothing very much. Straight communications, a little radar. Mm. No chance to continue any of the research you started when you were at the university, huh? No. Afraid I've gotten rusty? Not really. But there are just going to be the three of us to do the bulk of the work. You, myself, and a chap named Roy Fields. He worked with Ramsey at Tech. And what's the project? Something big? I think so. We're going to try and establish radio contact with the moon. What? Theoretically, it shouldn't be too difficult, you know. Of course it... And with the progress we've made during the war, we... Oh, Professor, it's terrific. One of the most exciting things I've ever heard of. <laughs> Think so? Well, don't you? Don't you remember when we used to talk about it in the lab? What it would mean to the astronomers, the astrophysicists, measurements that they've never even <laughs> be, been able to take before? Yes, John, I remember. Well, then? I don't know. Somehow it... Well, it worries me. How we're going to do it? No, that's all cut and dried. What's going to happen when we do do it? Well, what do you mean? We're reaching out, John. Reaching out into places where man has never been before. We're pretty close to the secret of matter, to the origin of life and to the mystery of the universe. Sometimes, sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble on something that's too much for us, too big and... <laughs> that's silly. 
Go pick out a bunk and get some rest, John. Tomorrow, we go to work. The work? I remember that all right, weeks of it. And finally, the big night, the night we were ready for our first test. It was clear and cool, the ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs, as if it were waiting. Every star separate and distinct, like signposts on the road to the infinite. Martell at the table in the center of the laboratory with the charts and diagrams doing the computing. Roy at the power controls, and I at the director. Time, 2302. 15 seconds. Power, 10.12. Check. You're reading, John. 93 degrees. Make it plus 0.2. Check. Time, 2302.10. Power on. Three seconds. Four. Now. How long to wait? We should get it almost immediately. A lag of not more than... There, listen. Huh? That's it. That's it. We've done it. We're in contact with the moon. Yes, we'd done it. Reached out into space and done it. For the first time since man had walked erect, we had established contact with another heavenly body. Bridged the infinite with man-made electrical impulses. There was no work done during the next two days, just excitement. Public relations broke the story the next morning and we were swamped. Newspaper reporters, photographers, interviews, commentaries, prophecies. Finally, we got back to normal. And a couple of nights later... Yes... It's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. I looked at my watch, almost midnight. Roy was asleep in his bunk, and I didn't wake him. I padded out along the duckboards to the laboratory. The lights were on. I went in, and there was Professor Martell. He was sitting at the control table, and he was... Well, he was funny. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. I said... Hello, Professor. He didn't move. He didn't answer. I took a quick look at the control board, and the frequency had been changed. A little uneasy, I, I tried again. Professor, what are you doing? And then, then something very strange happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up, while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched, while his left one remained stiff. It was just for a fraction of a second. Then... What? Oh. Hello, John. Hello, Professor. Anything the matter? Matter? What am I doing in here? I don't know, sir. I heard the generators go on, and I came in and found you here. Strange. Very strange. I went to bed about 10.30. Ever walked in your sleep before? No, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Very disturbing dream. Did you change the transmitter frequency that way? But, no, sir. You must have done it yourself in your sleep. Funny. That would make it more of a carrier instead of a transmitter wave. Uh, shall I shift it back? No, leave it. I'd like to take a look at it again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. The next morning, somehow, neither of us mentioned it. I can't be sure now whether we didn't remember or just didn't think it was important. But that night... Yes. Yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. That we knew. It was the sound of the generators that woke me again. I looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. And it was then that I noticed that Roy wasn't in his bunk. I lay there. And for some reason, I was terrified, trembling... There was something in the air, a feeling of... a feeling of menace that... I made myself get up. Slipped on a pair of sneakers and went out along the duck walk to the laboratory. The lights were on again. I didn't go in this time, but, but I looked in the window. There was Roy, and there was Professor Martell again. He was sitting at the control table with that... that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. What is it, sir? What's going on? Is anything the matter? Hmm. He's asleep. Walking in his sleep. I better get Larkin and... Oh, I can't leave the generator on, though. Gotta shut that off first. He turned and started to walk across the room toward the master switch. And as he turned, 
Markel moved. His face stayed dead, expressionless, but he moved. He got up without a sound, took a heavy wrench from the work table, and followed Roy. And then, just as Roy put out his hand to throw the switch, he hit him. I heard his skull go like the shell of a rotten pumpkin, and he went down, dead. I, I couldn't move. I couldn't make a sound. I just stood there, frozen with horror. Martell looked down at him without batting an eye. And then, like a zombie, he walked over to the bench, picked up a hacksaw and went back. And then, bending over Roy's body, he started cutting off the top of his head. The voice from the void and the midnight waking. Memories, things best forgotten, coming back again. Memories of the terror that came out of space and of murder at midnight. And now, back to Murder at Midnight and Terror Out of Space. That was, that's all I remember then. When Professor Martell bent over Roy's body with a hacksaw in his hand, I must have fainted. When I opened my eyes, I was lying on the sand outside the shack, and there was Martell bending over me. No, Professor, no, no, don't! Why, don't, John! What's the matter? Leave me alone. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. In where? Where? Just now in the shack to Roy. Aren't you well either, John? What? What do you mean? I just came up here from the cartridge. I had a bad dream. I've been having quite a few of them lately, and I woke up with a very annoying headache. I came out to take a walk. It's a mare. I found you lying but, here. But I, I'm telling you, I saw you. I saw you in there with Roy and... And, and what? Well, I don't even want to think about it. But you killed him. Killed him? Huh. Let's go back to the bunkhouse, John. Take a look. The bunkhouse? Yes, when you see that Roy is where we should be in bed, maybe it'll convince you that you either dreamed or imagined the whole thing. He led the way to the bunkhouse, and I followed. Still shaken, but starting to feel a little foolish. This was the Professor Martell I had studied under, known for years, the man who wouldn't hurt a fly. We went into the bunkhouse, and Roy's bed was empty. He wasn't there. Martell gave me a funny look and started calling. Roy! Roy, where are you? Roy! Without a word, we hurried back to the laboratory, and there was no sign of him there either. Nothing. Wait, he, he must have gone out for a walk too, Professor, or maybe jeeped into town. I, if it was true, there'd be something here. His body, blood... There, John. Well, right there, in front of the switch. But there's nothing there. No. Except that it looks as if this floor was just scrubbed. The floor... What? You're right. Don. Huh? Did you change the transmitter frequency this way? Oh, no, sir. You must have done it. Just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No. Tell me what you saw happen tonight. Everything you remember, whether you believe it now or not. Well, it was... It was pretty terrible, Professor. And then, as quietly as, as if he were a laboratory specimen, you took a hacksaw and started to cut off the top of his head. Merciful heavens. Talking to you now, I know the whole thing's mad, impossible, but... Yes, mad, impossible, I... but... You... You mean it could have happened some way? Without your knowing it? Sit down, John. Relax. Tell me what you know about the moon. Uh, the moon is a satellite. A stellar body. Probably formed by our sun in an encounter with some other stellar body. Yes, yes. Probably formed at the same time as the Earth. But it may very well have supported life long before there was life here. Life? But we know what its atmosphere yes, is. We know what it is now. But how do we know what it was a million, several million years ago? Suppose, just suppose, that there was life there millions of years ago. Life that reached a level of development we cannot even imagine. Suppose it died out as a form of life that we could recognize, but remained in a form that is eternal. What? 
What do you mean? In the form of electrical energy. We know that thought is an electrical process. An electrocephalograph will give a definite reading when a man is thinking. Yes. Suppose intelligence has continued to exist on the moon in the form of complex electric charges. And suppose a channel is suddenly opened between the moon and some other planet. The beams we sent out are our radar beams. You mean they, they could come down, down the beam, take hold of someone, you, and make you... I'm supposing, John, the prophesizer. But the fact is that the transmitter was set at carrier frequency, and none of us did it consciously. Of course, even if it's true, we have no way of knowing whether these entities are dangerous, malevolent or not. No way of knowing, but, but they killed. They made you kill. Made you kill Roy. Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with the place they came from. As for the rest, well, they would be intensely curious about the human body, particularly the brain. They would want to examine it. And of Good Lord, Professor, do you realize what you're saying? The taking over of a person's body? Yes, is... John, I do realize what I'm saying. Well, I don't believe it myself. Have you a gun? Uh, why, why, yes. Yes, I never carry it. Well, but... start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, incomprehensible, don't hesitate. Shoot. I didn't sleep that night. I remember that now. And I was convinced that I would never sleep again. Because... It was there then, the moon. It was there all the time, of course, day and night. But it was during the night when I was asleep that it would be easiest for them that they might try and... and... <laughs> no, I can't think about it. I won't even now. With the daylight, I felt a little better. Roy hadn't come back, but, well... There were a dozen possible explanations for that. I went to have another talk with Professor Martell. And he was gone, too. His bed was empty, as if it had never been slept in. I waited until about noon. Then I called headquarters. I had decided that I was going to tell them only facts, things I could believe myself. Hello? Hello, Colonel. This is Larkin over at Radar Experimental. Oh, yes, Larkin. How are you? Uh, pretty good, sir. Uh, I'd like to report that both Sergeant Shields and Major Martell are missing. I don't know, sir. They were both gone when I got up this morning. A-W-O-L, eh? <laughs> well, that's my fault. You men have been working awfully hard, and I meant to suggest that you take leaves. Uh, why don't you go missing, too? Oh, no, sir, I, I couldn't. Not right now. Okay. And you carry on until they get back, and then I'll arrange for you to do it uh, officially. So I stayed. Stayed there in the lonely shack on top of the cliff alone. And that was the most awful, terrible week of my life. Only the wind, the pounding of the surf, and my fears, fears that were with me constantly. There was work I had to do, but I had to force myself to go into the laboratory. Then, on Friday, they found Roy's body. A phone call took me to town to the local funeral parlor. When I got there, the colonel was waiting. Um, you knew Sergeant Shields pretty well, didn't you, Larkin? Yes, sir. Uh, some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. I uh, wish you'd look at it. Of course, sir. Uh, right here. Oh, good, good Lord. Evidently, the fish were pretty hungry. Well, no one could be sure, sir, but I think that is Shields. All right, Larkin. Thank you. Yes, they found Roy's body. And that night, Martell came back. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep. But the sound of the generators woke me again. I lay there listening, unbelieving but terrified because there was no one at the station but me. Then, picking up my gun, I went down the duck walk to the laboratory. I opened the door, and there he was, Professor Martell. His face was thin and haggard. His eyes were dead, lackluster, the way they'd been those other two nights. And when he spoke... His voice was hardly human, as if someone was using him, speaking through him. Too bad that you woke up, Larkin. You should not have come in here. What do you mean, Professor? Where have you been? We have been looking over your planet, studying it. Very interesting. And now we are ready to go. Go? Go where? What are you talking about? What? What? Are you... you... You said we... Professor Martell, have, have they... Just a few preparations to make. And then... Then... The voice, that horrible voice stopped. 
Martell swayed as if he were going to fall. I grabbed him, and he opened his eyes. He was himself again. And when he spoke, it was with his own voice. John. John, for heaven's sake, help me. Help me. How, Professor, how? Look, I'm... What I told you, don't you remember? Don't you understand? They've got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country. Looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain. They sucked me dry. And now... Now they're going to take me back with them. Back with them? Back to where they came from. Not my body. They're not interested in that. But the essential me. The... The... It has its name. Shoot, John. Shoot and... Uh, now we are ready. They had him again. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you... You will not remember. You will remember nothing. Do you understand? Because someday we may come back. I stood there, frozen, still holding on to Martell. Like a sleepwalker with superhuman strength, he pushed me away. I staggered back against the wall. Stiffly and mechanically, he walked to the door, opened it, and went out. The surf was thundering, the wind blowing straight to the edge of the cliff he walked, and then went over. But before he fell, he seemed almost to hover for a moment. As if something in him was going not down, but up. Now, do you remember, John? Now, do you remember? You've got to remember. You've got to. I tricked them. Fooled them. That's how I was able to get through to you. But they'll be coming for me any minute. And down. You've got to do something. You've got to. It's true. They do exist. And they've got me here. And they'll be coming back again for others. They did. When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. Written out in my own handwriting, but a little scrawled and jerky as if my hand wasn't quite steady. Some of it I remember. Other parts like Roy's murder, Professor Martell's suicide, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, no, I can't think about it. I mustn't. Anyway, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I'm mad. So now I'm going to burn it. Burn it up completely. White and shaking, John Larkin tears the scrawled pages from his notebook, crumples them into an ashtray, and puts a match to them. And thus there disappears into ashes the only remaining evidence of the terror from out of space and of murder at midnight. in some unknown form. And the clocks strike twelve for... Murder! At midnight. The part of John Larkin was played by George Petrie. And Peter Capel was Professor Martell. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Anton M. Leder.